Hi there, and welcome to VD Trainer Interviews. I've got a fantastic treat for you today. With me is uh, Denise Lloyd. Denise is a woman of a multi-checkered background, all in a good sense. Um, she's also a woman of many talents. And uh, it's, it's quite a treat to have you here, Denise, and, and, and welcome to VD Trainer Interviews. What a lovely accolade. What, what do I need to say now? <laughs> Just acknowledge it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Denise, um, as you know, with, with VD Trainer, we, we focus on, on entrepreneurs, uh, people also interested in their own personal development. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you here. I think with, with your background and what you've done, um, you really have a, a number of things that you can tell our subscribers. Um, and I'd, I'd like to dig into your past if you don't mind. Not at all. You might find stuff that I don't even know about. <laughs> I, this morning when I prepared for, for the interview, um, I, read, I read your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I, I spend maybe once or twice a week on LinkedIn, which is probably not enough. Um, I realized, or I saw this morning, that you, you describe yourself as a freelance journalist uh, for a number of pu publications. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, Dion. Um, I actually started my career um, in the marketing field. Yes. Because after I did my first degree, there was a year period that um, lapsed before a brand new course was introduced into mm -hmm. the University of Stellenbosch. And we won't ask the year. Obviously, it's... You know, oh, you just can the other guess, day. You can guess, yeah. <laughs> but it was, a, as I said, a brand new yes. course. It was the Be Honest Journalism. And it was, okay, I will set the year. <laughs> May I? <laughs> you can say the year. You can say the year. <laughs> well, it was supposed to kick off in 1977. Yes. And what happened was that the professor that was going to introduce it was an icon in our South African news history, and it's Professor Pitzel Year. Mm. He was to head this brand new school at the University of Stellenbosch, the uh, journalism school. But he was still in Colombia, where at that state university, they had a course similar to this, mm. and he was mm. there to have a look and see what they, they wanted people to do. And uh, so it happened that it wasn't in time. And I had a year to, to work with. I didn't want to do my honours in geography because that was my one main subject. I could do town planning, but that was a two-year course. So I decided, no, I, want, I really want to be available when this journalism course starts. Okay. okay. And my other main subject was Afrikaans Netherlands, which at that stage, I think I had enough of trees, how words... Uh, were put together, and I thought, I'm never going to use these grammar trees in my life. So I definitely didn't want to do honors in that. <laughs> yes, and I started yes. off as a marketing official for the then NAS book, which is now part of the um, NASPAS, mm, uh, mm. Media24, which is one of the biggest media companies yes, in the world. Yes, yes. And as it so happened, after all these years, I've, I'm now again a Media 24 <laughs> employee. So you've come full circle. I've come full circle. But yeah, I uh, started off as a, as a um, marketing official, not ever having thought of going into marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At school, I, had, I made the decision I want to do something, something exciting, something different. And what came up was either law or journalism, you probably took the. <laughs> you probably made the better choice by choosing journalism. Well, journalism for for the viewer um, must be the career where you get the most self. Um, help me with the word. Um, you get a lot of uh, pleasure out. Mm. Um, the word I'm looking for. Fulfillment, maybe. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You're never going to make a lot of money. In journalism. Yes, it's but a the calling. Perks, yeah, but the perks, yeah. I think in the year when we started our honours in 78, we met more people, mm. high, high risers, high flyers, than most people meet in their whole life. Tell me, it, it, it's interesting to hear, you know, I wasn't going to ask about the, uh, the year or your age. I always say I'm a gentleman and a gentleman never asks. But, but that being said, I mean, that was a... 
that was obviously a different time. You know, it was a, a different time altogether, I think, especially for, for, for women in the workplace, maybe. Oh, um, yes. You either became a, a, a nurse, yes. a, a teacher, um, a librarian. A housewife. A housewife. And for some reason, I just don't see you as, uh, <laughs> you know, either one of those. <laughs> I, I can cook, I can bake, I hate. I've got five, four <laughs> pet hates. I don't iron, I don't dust. I hate filing, and I hate, <laughs> I hate writing minutes, although I love writing yeah. articles. <laughs> there's writing and there's writing. There's yes. writing and writing. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But, yeah, it was a different time. Yeah. It was um, when I became, or after I studied and got my degree and did my practical and uh, opened a new office for mm. Media24 mm. in Utenay, there in the I'd Eastern say. Cape, yeah, yeah. after being um, at the... Westerlich in those days in, in PE. Uh, I was there for about three months and they sent me to open an office in for them in Utenay. But um, it was a case of I came, I got married, came back or came to Mossel Bay and became the first editor of the local paper, the known as the Mossel Bay Advertiser. It was just bought over by a, a company or an arm of Caxton. Okay, which the was group, group, yeah, but yeah, group editors yeah, yes. in, in this area. And uh, Radio Today did an interview with me shortly after I was yes. appointed. And they said to me that at that stage, there was only three women in newspaper editors in the country. And you were one. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize it. That. I didn't <laughs> know it at that stage, but yeah, until they told me. Yes, and yes. it was fun because I realized why... We would get a lot of calls, and people, mm. especially men, would phone and say to, say to the receptionist, um, can I please speak to the editor? And then they put the caller through to me. Of and course, I would say, as the editor. As the editor. Yes. Um, Good afternoon, can I help you? May I please speak to the editor? Uh, <laughs> I say, you are speaking to the editor. No, 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 you don't understand. I want to speak to the editor. Yes, sir. I am the editor. No, 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 you're a woman. Well, <laughs> you cannot be the editor. <laughs> no, today, yes. I mean, there's, I think, about 80 plus percent. One could maybe Google that yeah, yeah, and see yeah. how many edit women <clears throat> editors there are, not just newspapers, magazines. Um, yeah, most, most of your communication, I would say, is done, or a lot of the communication is done by women. Yeah, it's probably, if you think about it, I mean, being an editor, as you, as you framed it, being in, in the communication industry, it's probably something that is slightly better suited to, to the female, female orientation, isn't it? Women are definitely different to men, emotionally wise. Mm. And um, they are nurturers, most, of, most women are. And I believe you have to have a caring mm. inside you to be able to write articles, the empathy that you have mm. with people. Yes, when you're in mainstream um, uh, newspaper world, uh, especially your dailies, there's a lot of blood, gore, um, sensation. Yeah, of course. And as Professor Sillier said to us, you guys must remember that if you're not prepared to write about everything that hurts other people, mm. that mm. are bad to other people, then you might as well take your bags and leave now yeah, because yeah. that is what may, uh, news is made of. Mm. But now we've come quite a long way in the sense that a lot of our community papers are more based on your good news stories. Yes. And you also now, or I now also get the opportunity to write lovely articles, positive stuff. Yes. Um, but I'm glad I had the background of blood and gore and... Um, going into the front lines, almost there. I, mm. I was there. I can even, yeah, you, you've been there and, and, and done that. And the 79 riots. I can just imagine. Got injured, but it was my own stupidity. <laughs> we weren't supposed to be where we were, but yeah. now being a, a journalist, you have a nose which has a tendency of leading you to places where you shouldn't be. Sure, sure. <laughs> it's interesting, and, and I'll use that as a segue for the, for the next question. Um, something which you haven't mentioned is your, your experience or your background um, in marketing and actually the heights that you achieved in, in marketing also. Um, 
In fact, when, when I got to know you, uh, a few years back already now. You know, can, it was when you came to Marcel when Bay, when was that? Can you it's, remember? It's, it's, well, it's about five years ago now. Yeah, yeah. should be. Um, you were quite a high-profile marketer here in the Garden Route. Um, maybe you can tell, tell our subscribers a little bit about, about that. Yeah, as I said, it was a, a case of I never thought of marketing as something I wanted to do. Yes. And then when in 76, after I did my BA degree, um, I had that year to play with. And I landed as a marketing official for NASBOOK. And which then later, as you said, became part of NASPER. Yeah, and, and which is part of Media 24. Media 24, um, okay. Well, Media 24 being part of NASPER. Oh, sorry, yeah, that course, way yeah. around. That, yes, that yes, is our. yes. And um, <laughs> it was something, as I said, I never thought of. And then I kind of enjoyed. I worked with schools at that stage, with handbooks for schools, textbooks for schools. And I suddenly realized that if you, you have something you believe in, you could identify with, and I could identify with school books, textbooks. I just came out of varsity, and, and I knew how important information was. Yes. And uh, after that year, when I had to go back, uh, or I decided to go back to varsity, I thought, now I have to say goodbye to a company car. I had a, um, a lovely salary. I got a um, clothing allowance. And I, yeah, yeah. and I had what we called a ticky box fund, which was enough money every day to stop at the roadhouse there in Goodwood <laughs> and have a, a lunch there, and the company paid for it. Yes. And here I'm now going back to university, no money to study. Is that really something? And then I decided, no, that was my dream to become a journalist, and that is what I was going to do. And I never thought about marketing again. Mm. My focus was on journalism. I wanted to be out there. I wanted to take pictures. I wanted to write. I wanted to tell people stories. And I wanted to um, convey the facts. Mm. Uh, that was mm. the one important thing to me. Because once or twice before, I was involved in something where the facts weren't given accurately. Mm. And it was my decision then that if ever I'm in a position to write something, it must always be fact, factually based. Of course. And uh, I don't think most people realize just how powerful the pen is. I can, I can imagine. Would you say, though, that, that marketing and journalism um, are you know, closely related, maybe? Because you do tell stories in both. Yes, definitely. And I don't think people realize the importance of that. Because if you can, if you can write... If you can put your idea or your product into um, words and get it out to the world, you have a much better chance to succeed in mm. what you've set out to do. And, and as I say, it was very, very funny that I once or oh, I landed back in, in marketing. Mm. That, that wasn't my aim or my end result too at any time. But then after you married, most of us, at some stage have kids and viewers there is a very important lesson in this if you're in journalism it's a 24 7 career. yeah yes yes journalism it's hard on a family it's very hard yeah. on a family I don't want to quote statistics but if you go and have a look you'll find the divorce rate under journalists or amongst journalists is very, very high. I can just imagine, yeah. Um, even journalists married to journalists and journalists married to photographers who are supposed to then be able to know one another's mm. worlds are still very, very high. So and in a sense, sorry for interrupting, in a sense you almost become married to the, to the job of being a, you do. a journalist. You absolutely become, yeah. you become your career. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, when I had kids, I realized that, you know, a baby doesn't realize what a, what a deadline is. And a deadline has got no sympathy for a baby. So then I decided I have to, mm. to um, try other avenues. Because you did have a baby then. Yeah, I had. Mm. But, but at that stage, I had already been in journalism for 10 years. Yeah. And... Um, just incidentally, I never thought I would have kids because I, there was no time in their life 
or in my life, there was no time for them. Mm -hmm. And there was, when I, the day I decided that maybe it's not a bad idea, <laughs> um, all my friends started saying, oh, this poor child, somewhere along the line, they'll just have to fall out because there's not even going to be time to go into hospital or anything like that. <laughs> the baby must know. Uh, the baby must know yeah. and the baby will need to fit into yes. this life. And yeah, uh, yeah and, and as it so happened, um, both my kids slotted in beautifully. They actually got the opportunity to, to go to places that they would never have because I, I, even though I went into marketing then and into management, I took my kids with me mm, mm. and exposed them mm. to everything. Mm. Um, after I left journalism, uh, we also I went into the center marketing, center management. Like a shopping center? A shopping, a mall, where I did the, the, the marketing, the management, and the PR. Goodness. So that was a combination. I started off as a, as, as a PR. Uh, yes. Officer, yes. and that evolved within a few months into management. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the marketing came with it. So I see marketing and uh, management and PR almost as um, different pillars of the same mm. thing. Mm. Mm. And if you can, mm. if you can combine all three of them, you have so much more uh, to succeed with than. Just pure marketing as such. I, I love that. Um, I mean, you, you, you mentioned, you know, that it's about telling stories. And I think that that gives me a, a wonderful segue into the question that I wanted to ask you, which is how do you see copywriting in a, in a business context these days? Um, with your background as a, as a proven marketer, as a proven journalist, as a journalist now, um, you know, what, what is copywriting for business? And um, maybe there are a few, uh, a few other things, but I'd like to know what you think about, you know, copywriting for business. Is it still, is it still important? Oh, I don't think um, that owners really realize how important it is. Mm. It's one of those things that can actually almost make or break your business. Um, just coming back quickly to the marketing side, after the management, uh, which I did for quite some time, I went on to becoming the marketing manager of the Diaz Strand Hotel. Which just for, 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 our, for our viewers, um, is, is one of the, it was one of the leading hotels at that time in the Garden Route. It was one of the first four stars, four star hotels, yeah. And um, they started off from scratch as such. At that stage, you must remember all marketing experience yes. per se that I had was that one year. Um, before I went back to Varsity, uh, the, the rest of the marketing e that experience I gained mm. was at, in the management side of it. Okay. And okay. there I was. I thought I was being um, appointed to doing the PR work um, for the hotel until the manager, the general manager, after about four weeks that I was there, asked me, where's my marketing plan? And I said, excuse me? He said, your marketing plan? I said, I you didn't get the memo? <laughs> I said, I don't have a marketing plan. Yes. He said, but how can you be the marketing manager of a four-star hotel if you've got no marketing plan? I said, um, uh, 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 uh. we were having coffee, and I said to him, Harvey, stop the bus. <laughs> I'm going to waste your time. I think we're not on the same page yet. Yes, yes. I said, who told you I'm the marketing manager? He said, well, that's what your title is. I said, no, 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 no. I was appointed as, as the PR yeah. oh, of the hotel. He said, no, no, no. That's not what they told me. So duly, the two of us walked. Congratulations with your promotion just now. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. And when, when we came, got to the resort manager, yeah. he said, um, you are doing the marketing. You're doing so well. So we just decided you will be the marketing manager. And from what I remember, you were actually quite intricately involved in, in obviously the hotel's PR and marketing, but also with maybe at the time putting uh, the whole of, the, of Mossel Bay and at the very least maybe Diaz Beach uh, almost on the map, you know, from a completely unknown entity or unknown holiday destination almost 
to, to one of the foremost holiday destinations in the Garden Route. It so happened, it, once again, a lot, lots of stuff in my life happens without being planned. <laughs> yes. I had parents that said to us, you know, you don't have to have everything else that yeah. other kids have. The one thing you must do is you must, see, uh, you must grab every opportunity that comes your way. Sure. And make the best of it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and that so happened that when, when I thought I was the PRO and became the marketing manager, I was marketing a hotel that hadn't even been built. I was appointed, I did some, no, one step back. I did a holiday program for yes. Diaz uh, Beach. Initially, Diaz Beach was, or there might be some of the viewers in, in, in South Africa that recall that Diaz was a caravan park. I remember that. Yeah, still. towards I still the remember end that. Yeah, of the previous century. It was yes. just a caravan park. Yes. Beautiful. It had a hall and a few chalets, and that was it. Yes. And... Um, People were up in arms when a company came and bought the ground from the municipality and they said they were going to put high density housing there, an hotel, single residential, entertainment, and everybody started screaming and saying, but how, it's such a beautiful area, how can they build on it? What people didn't realize at that stage was we in Mossel Bay don't have big factories, we don't have industries, all we really have is tourism mm. and if we want to create jobs for our people we have to go the tourism way of course to a big extent okay. and that's what happened but Mossel Bay then wasn't you know it wasn't the the first um, tourism destination in the garden route or even even in, in Eden the Eden district uh, that people would think about you know if they if they had to plan their holidays Mossel Bay would not have been the first stop they might have gone Neisner, Neisner, Plettenberg Bay. Yeah, the, those were the, the garden And you route. were up against that? We were up against that. The, mm. the one thing um, that was evident almost immediately was that your touring companies could not come to Mossel Bay with buses. Because yes. there was no hotel for them to stay in. Okay. Because now you come with 60 plus people. You have to have at least 30 rooms mm. If, mm. if those are double, mm. uh, you know, uh, 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 husband and wife teams or whatever. And there just wasn't place for them to stay. Yes. We had beautiful guest houses, but you can't That's drop what the two six want. people at this guest house, ten at the other. Just think of the logistics to go and collect everybody again. Okay, yeah. So the planning to put up a 86-room hotel, 11 stories high, 12 in actual fact with the um, starlight room, was totally unheard of. Mm. And because of the location, it being on the beach, I remember one of my marketing uh, phrases that I coined. The only thing between you and the beach is a cocktail bar. And you can either go through it or around it. And, I mean, I loved it. Yes. I, I you started, brought them with the ocean and you brought them with the bar. Yes. <laughs> and, and, I mean, that was yes. in January 2004. February, yeah. no, January towards the end, I went abroad. Mm. to go and market this hotel that wasn't there. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I went with uh, Mossel Bay Tourism to the Fakanti Beer, which is the largest um, tourism show for um, consumers in Europe. Okay. We're talking about between 150 and 180,000 people coming through yes. that yeah. um, show in five days, six days. Yeah, yeah. So there I was, never even having been to an Indaba in our country, yes. which we think is the big one. And there, there I had to market a, a product that I soon realized I, I have to do this with passion. And I thought, I love the ocean. It's going to be so exciting. It has to do with people. Um, Mossel Bay, to me, became home, mm, and mm. it was already 20 plus years. We came to Mossel Bay in 81, and I, I believed in the town. And I'm, I, you know and I know yes. that if you believe in a product and you're positive about it, mm. you can actually sell it. And there I was with not a lot of marketing experience, my dear, <laughs> talking to people, asking them what they would like to see when they come to South Africa. Yes, yes. 
And it was amazing how people would react if you ask them. They used to people telling them why they should come. And you actually, you I know, asked them what they would like to come and yeah. do. I did exactly the same at the first in Darbo, which was in May that year. Remember, I didn't have a hotel. I had nothing basically to work and not with. Not a well-known destination either. No. Mm. And I stood there, and at in Darbo, you have a lot of um, uh, agents from abroad. They're coming to buy South Africa for their customers. Mm. And I went around and I said to people, "Excuse me, um." I have, I'm going to have a new hotel. I don't really know what it's all about. Tell me what you want. Um, what would swing you to come to the product? And it was amazing how people helped. Lots of, there was a marketing uh, manager at Fancourt, which is a very well-known yeah. hotel in our yes. area. Yes. And she came to me and she said, you know, I heard you talking to somebody and saying that, that you're not very... Um, you don't think you're very good at this because you don't have the background. Um, you want to help, but you don't know how. And she said, you know what? I will help you. Mm. And it was amazing. And, and afterwards, I realized that that was the right way to go. Mm. People, when you start telling people, they think you know everything. Yeah, and they're yeah. not very prepared to help you. Yeah. If you go in with an attitude, I want to learn, I want to do what you guys want to. Mm. It helps a lot. And that is one of the lessons I've learned through the years. We've come from an area or a period where you as a product owner could give certain things to people. Now, people have got the money or people with the money. They have list. They, you must give them what they want. Of course. Not what you yes, have. Yes, Because that might not be what they, and I, I can decide what I want to do with my money. Of course. Yeah, my, my, you know, you mentioned so many things actually that I can react on. I think the first thing that I heard was you, you sold your product, even if it wasn't a real product It yet. wasn't a real it product yet. It was a dream yet. almost. You sold, it was. You sold the idea, but with passion. Yeah, and, and, and the funny thing is, Dion, it is a hideous looking building. Um, <laughs> at at the, the, um, the first impressions I had are the architect yes. impressions that I took to Indaba. A guy came to me and he said, when did you renovate this building? I said, no, but you don't understand. It's, 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 not, it's not even a building. <laughs> not it, yeah, yeah, this is what it looks like. Yeah, this is what it's going to mm. He said, no, but that's a pre-war structure. It looks like something just after the war they put, put up. Yeah. It's a square, horrible looking, the colors you're using for it. I mean, who, who do you want to impress with this? And I stood there and I thought, heavens alive, what am I going to do? Because it is a hideous looking building. <laughs> it, the colors scream at one another. Yeah. But this is what the developers are putting up. Of course. And I thought, okay, location, location, location. That's the three... Um, yes. Biggest things in marketing. Location, location, location. And, the, and this it, hotel had that. that. It had it. And that yeah. was what I had to work with. And later, when the building was there, I could actually... And, I, and the inside was beautiful. Mm. And if you're in the rooms, all 86 rooms had their own balconies. They could look out over the majestic... Uh, Otaniqua Mountains, the warm so Indian mountain Ocean. So mountain view and a sea view. Everyone. Actually, a, 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 a view of the beach itself with yes. the waves breaking. Yeah, oh, and there's pristine beautiful. Yeah. Um, white beaches going all the way to Hartley That Bos. long beach. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I realized if I could just get the people past the front door. Yeah. <laughs> Almost they see it like you see it. <laughs> yes, yes. I could get them into the hotel, yeah. and they would come back. Yeah. The yeah. return business was always there. But it was all these disadvantages I had to work with. And remember, I didn't have the papers. Yeah, I you didn't were not go a and qualified study. marketer. I was, no, 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 yes. no, no, no. I had to work with passion, with belief, and conveying or getting the message mm. across to the guy to say, just believe in this with me. I think the other thing that I'm hearing, uh, obviously with, with entrepreneurs, um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs sometimes fall into the analysis paralysis trap where they want their product to be absolutely perfect. And they spend so much time 
on the design or strategizing of the product or the business or the systems or the processes of this business that they don't actually get to the place where they start doing the business. Um, what I hear you saying is that you know you you almost I don't want to. I don't want to say you you just jumped in. <laughs> well, I've thrown in. But to Never mind, jumped you did. in. <laughs> the product wasn't ready, um, oh. yet you had to go out and sell the idea, which you did. Um, you combined that with what you knew. You know, your background was um, in telling stories, and you told a story that that obviously was compelling because I mean the history showed that the DS Hotel and the whole DS. Uh, area became a very popular tourist attraction after that uh, in your time. So you can, you know, you are directly credited with, with that. Yeah, I think I need to tell the viewers when we started, well, when I started with the hotel, remember I had already been working in this area as a journalist. People knew me as a journalist. Yes. Um, and I also did a lot of PR work for mm. other entities and that. And there was another hotel in Mossel Bay at that stage, and the owner was, he was annoyed with me that I could go to the opposition, <laughs> as he mentioned it. And we actually went to him and said to him, you know, your hotel has been going for five years. Um, it's also a four-star. We, we're bringing in a bigger hotel, but... Just give us some pointers. We need to take one another's hands. You can't, you can't take the big groups coming into town because you can only sleep, sleep X amount of people. We want to um, not take a slice of the cake. What I, I set out to do is I want to add... I want to, you want to make the cake bigger? I actually wanted to add the, the icing. Okay, okay. Because at that stage, it was a case of conferencing, well, the Artica Fia, which is down the road here at mm, Hartenbos, mm. they were the only conferencing people in this area. At the time. At the time. Mm. There was no others. Mm. And I thought there was a very big um, vacuum in, in conferencing because we had beaches. We could um, entertain the people. It was the lovely views, the nature, there was a lot of stuff people could do. They could come and do team building here, mm. but we just didn't capitalize mm. Mm. on it. So to me, that was a bit of icing, the cherry I could bring to it. And I said to him, I'm not going to take your clients and I won't steal them at all. But if you don't service them and they come to me. That's competition. That's competition. Yeah. But I won't, I won't say, set out, you, you're not my market. I mm. want to create a new market. I find that absolutely fascinating that you, um, you literally went to the direct, because in a certain sense, he was the, 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 the competition. The, yeah, he was. Um, and you actually went to him directly. So your market research was essentially also, you know, or part of it at least, was, was talking to the opposition um, as you researched your market. I think there is a lesson in that for, for, for our viewers also, you know, and that's that um, all, all that we've said already about passion and, you know, getting into it and, you know, not, not, not freezing up and actually Running just, away. Yeah, just starting with it, but, but also then knowing your market, mm. you know, and, and learning. Always um, having a, 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 uh, an approach of learning almost, you know, being open to to, to, to the lessons that others that, that have gone before you, to, to learn from them. Um, I've seen it in my own business as well. You know, when, when we started out, um, it, it, it was a similar thing. And, and we never had the, uh, you know, we never had the, uh, the way of thinking that, that we are better than others. Um, we also said that, you know, we're going to learn. Um, and, and even still today, you know, uh, we still see ourselves as students of, of the game, um, mm. almost, and I think that's 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 one of the lessons maybe out of it. And that's the the lesson of perpetual learning uh, for entrepreneurs. But I actually, why, why I was telling that story is, uh, he said to us that specific day, he said, you know, it's taken him five years to get a average of thirty percent occupation right through the year. An average, then, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And. You guys are going to battle with 86 rooms to get a 30%. And I thought, hmm, that's a challenge. <laughs> so what happened? After two years, 
Diaz had a 52% So you average. were absolutely blowing him out of the water. It can be done. Yes. It can be done. Yes. Tell me, you know, we, we started talking a lot about tourism now, and I think I want to continue with it for a, for a little while. So you've been involved in tourism now for, for a number of years. Yeah. Um, obviously, in the garden route, tourism is, a, is quite a, an important part of the economy here. In your opinion, you know, how has tourism changed over the years up to the point where it is now? Well, I must tell you, in those years, um, Mossel Bay was not a destination. Sure. People went past on the N2. I mean, the fact that we're exactly halfway between Port Elizabeth and Cape Town makes us an ideal destination. Mm. But people zap uh, on this N2. They used to look upon Mossel Bay as a dingy little industrial town, um, Moscas. Mm. Well, if, if you look at Blue Planet, which is a um, tourism handbook that is very well known all over the world, it's the Bible of tourism for lots of people. Um, it described Mossel Bay as a dirty little <laughs> industrial town. Oh my goodness. Yes, and that was what we were up against in, uh, in so Europe. So you were selling the dirty little old town. Yeah, and what people, lots of people don't realize is you can't go abroad and sell the Astrand Hotel. Nobody has got the foggiest idea where the Astrand Hotel is. Yeah. When you try to market any product abroad, you have to start with the big, big picture. The big, big picture, South Africa. Yes. We're a, um, a, a, a far wall destination. People need to travel a long way. We, we are of competition yeah. with like the French Riviera, which also have magnificent beaches and that. Uh, Brilliant weather. Of well, course. Yes. So, so people mm. can go there for next to nothing. Mm. And they're there within an hour, two, three hours. Mm. To us, they travel anything from 12 to 24 hours to get to, to our shores. Mm. And so first you have to uh, sell South Africa as a destination. Then you get to the Western Cape. The province. The province, where Cape Town is, of course, our icon yes. and our best selling. Mm. Then after that, on the third tier, you get to the Garden Route, which was already the a branded name. Yeah. Mm. Then you get to Mossel Bay. And only on the fifth level can you get to your product. No, I, I completely agree with that. I think you sell country first, you know, province, area, town, and, and, and maybe also one of the things that, that, that I've realized um, being in tourism for a little while now is that uh, we should work together more of course. You know, with our neighboring towns, neighboring districts, because we are selling essentially the same product. Um, and, and, and getting a, a, a bigger influx of tourists will benefit all of us, really. Of course. And, yeah. and the other thing is you, you sell routes. People mm. don't just drop out of the air into Mossel Bay. Yes, they don't go to Mossel Bay as such. They go to an area as part of a bigger uh, you of know, course. itinerary. Of course. Yes. And, and, and that, th those are things in tourism that people didn't realize. Eh? Mossel Bay specifically, they thought we've got beautiful beaches. And that's mm. why people come. Uh -uh. What is the first thing that, uh, that makes somebody go to a specific area? People want to be entertained. Of course. So if it's sport adrenaline sport, they decide, okay, I am going to go bungee jumping. After that, well, when we still had the Goritz, uh bungee jumping, people would come, and then they decide, but where are we going to stay? They don't decide they're coming to Mossel Bay, and then they go okay. bungee jumping. I hear you, yes. Um, that was also a perception that we had to realize in tourism, yeah. And those are the lessons that you learned and as you went along? Those are the lessons that I got or learned the hard way, yes. a lot of it, but yeah. um, it just makes you realize and see the bigger picture. Uh, we all know that at this stage in Europe, money is not as abundant as it was. The yeah. Greek, the whole Greek tragedy last yeah. year and yes. now, yes. Um, we suddenly find that we do still get a lot of tourists, but the, the move has, or it has shifted from your traditional 
um, your European, European tourists. Tourist, to your more um, tourists from the East. Um, okay. The, 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 your Chinese, your... your um, Taiwanese. Taiwanese people. Mm, mm. When, when I went to Europe that first in 2004 to the Fokanti Beer and the Fokanti Salon, which is in Belgium, and we also went to Ireland and England, which was your more traditional markets, that the people at that stage didn't think that they could come to South Africa and travel in our country on mm. their own. Yes, yes. They came what we call group reiser. They came as a group and they would then come and stay one night in, in Mossel Bay, move on one night in Eisner, move on one night in Edo, move on and they would come as a group. The next year I went, 2005, I already started seeing there was a shift. Some of the people I saw the first year came again and mm. chatted with them, and they said, well, they came. Mm. I, it was the funniest thing, Dion. I was there in, towards the end of January. I gave a few people, or lots of people, mm. I gave my business card, mm. but on it I wrote, Come and have a cup of coffee. Come and have a glass of wine. Yes. The funny thing is, I got back just, I think, the 4th, the 4th of um, February was a Saturday. That Monday, the first person walked in with my card in his hand and said, I'm coming to have coffee with you. What, 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 I, what I hear you saying is almost that you, you got involved in the actual marketing almost on the ground. You went the out. One on one the one-on-one. The one-on-one. to people. Which is still probably the best way of, of selling your business and yourself. You know, we often say, oh, when you're in Muscle Bay, pop in. But do you, people don't take that literally. They think, oh, yeah, they're just saying, yeah, I gave them my card with a free glass of wine, a free <laughs> cup of coffee. Yes. And during the four years that I went to Europe every year, every time on return, people came with my card in their hand and came and had their coffee, their cool drink, their lunch. Some of them actually became friends afterwards. It's, it's interesting you should mention that. One of the things that I, um, my wife and I uh, used to watch a show on, on TV um, by a guy, I, I know he's a... He's a well-known hairstylist and business owner in, uh, in the UK, Peter something. I can't remember his surname now. Now, the show's whole premise is about you know, businesses uh, that are in trouble. And he would, as a successful business person, he would come and help them to turn around their businesses. And he always had this thing where he would basically take the business through a whole process of transformation, really, where they would you know, redo the look of the business itself and the look of the, 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 the owners, you know, so that they basically, you know, present themselves better. And he always had them go out as part of this whole process of transformation to, to actually go out into the street with flyers or their product. Maybe they sold cupcakes, or, you know, whatever. And they would take <laughs> out little cupcakes into the street and, 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 and sell those, you know, as the business, not the, not the staff, the business owners themselves. And I think that's a brilliant lesson to take from this also, you know, that uh, it's still, whatever you do, it's still something that relates to your business and people, you know, and, and, and how people perceive your business. So I, I love that. I love that lesson. Dion, I learned that people do business with a face. Yeah, of course. And yes. then the product. I can imagine. And talking about cupcakes, it's very funny. I just need to tell the viewers about this. Exactly. Muscle Bay is well known for, um, in 1488, Dias, Bartholomew Dias, that said foot year. Yeah. And uh, in 1988, we had the 500-year yes. um, festival. And at the Diaz Museum, there are outfits of the, the Portuguese sailors, Diaz himself and that. And... I got those outfits, <laughs> and I put our staff in them. Yes. And there was also a seal, two mm. seals, Sally Seal and, oh, I can't remember what the, the boy seal's name was. Saddle, probably. 
Wow, <laughs> anything. But now, two, two of the staff members yeah. into the SEALs, yeah. and two of them, one was Bartholomew Dias, and the other was just a normal sailor. And we put them at the robot there to Dias yeah. with cupcakes, which we dished out with a flyer and yes. my business card yes. to people, yes. and inviting them once <laughs> again to come and have a free cup of coffee in one of the restaurants. Yes. You can't believe how many people came and said they're coming to see the seals or they're coming to yeah. see Diaz. So it was a visual thing. Yes. They got a product, which was a cupcake to taste, and they got the card with, with the info. Mm. And people love anything free. Of I course. mean, we all like it. Oh, of course. Free. And, oh, and we all love a cupcake. Who doesn't like, yeah. like a cupcake? But cupcakes in 2005, six weren't mm. as, uh, as popular as now. But yeah, <laughs> they were free. They were free. <laughs> and I mean, it, it, it's amazing if you, if you think how, st not stupid, stupid's the wrong word, how simple mm. and effective stuff, some of your basic stuff. And, and I think the lesson from that also maybe is that your, um, your business starts locally. It starts with the people that are around you. Mm. You know, that's your, that's your first market. You know, that's where you start uh, to, to tell people about your business and then you can, you can grow it. Um, but you probably don't start by thinking about some sort of client that might be, you know, overseas or whatnot. If that's your business, then of course, of course, that's where, mm. you, where you will market. But it's often for, for the smaller type of businesses, it's, it's often, you know, you start with the people around you and you become well known in your area. Mm. Um, you you become, become your own brand, Yes, basically. of course, of course. I want to... Can I draw that back? I still haven't answered sure. your question. Sorry, I was, got totally waylaid <laughs> and uh, yeah. It seems that all our answers get, get waylaid, oh. but we still get a lot of, from it. <laughs> I must tell you, it brings back so many happy memories yes, just good. talking about a lot of this. Good. But the second year and the third year I went, and I started talking to those people again and asked them if they'd been to our country. A lot of them said, I visited your country, but I didn't experience it. And I thought, but that's stupid. How can you say you visit, but you didn't experience? Mm. And when I sat down with a guy specifically in Belgium, I said to him, explain to me. He said, you guys don't realize how big your country is. Yes. So if you, you put us in a bus in Cape Town, you drive all the way to Mossel Bay, which is 400 Ks. Yeah. If you drive 400 Ks in Europe, you've gone over the, the borders of it's two in a different country. countries, two yes. countries very often. Yeah, yeah. And then I thought, you know, this is a very good marketing aspect. They also said, and I'll tell you now why I'm saying that, they also said that the first time they came on a group razor in a bus, Mm. Which a whole itinerary Which is a was worked group, basically. out. Yeah. yeah. And the, your whole itinerary is worked out. Get in the bus, drive to Mossel Bay, mm. stop at Swellen Dam, have lunch there, get to, to Mossel Bay, um, walk on the beach, freshen up, dinner, breakfast tomorrow morning, round the point, Diaz Museum, whoop, there you go, ostriches, oat sweden, that <laughs> All type the of tourist traps, yeah. 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 I have been on a groepsreise last year. I enjoyed Mossel Bay so much. There were so many things to do. Mm. All I did was go to the museum, go around the point, got zapped off to another town. And I thought to myself, if we can get the people to stay in Mossel Bay, they're going to spend money in Mossel Bay. We're going to be able to tell the guy in the street, tourism, is everybody's business. If the guy drives a car, he needs petrol. He gets thirsty, he either stops Absolutely. at a restaurant, drinks coffee, he buys a cool drink mm. on the cafe, at the cafe on the corner. Mm. So everybody can start getting something out of this pool. But then we need to, to make the people stay here. Remember I said just now, yeah. they didn't stay there, because first there was no hotel accommodation. And... Over the years, the, the two operators have seen Mossel Bay as a morning stop or an afternoon stop. Mm, mm. <clears throat> Go around Seal Island, um, have lunch at the point or somewhere, go around the point and that's it. And I started working on that idea to, to um, make Mossel Bay a destination. To work out itinerary to say to them, fine, we're in Slap 
bang in the middle of the, uh, the garden route. You can stay in Mossel Bay now, okay? You've been to the ostriches. You've been to the Kango Cave. You really don't want to go again. Stay here. We let's are central. Do, <laughs> let's do the washing. Let, let the other guys go if you're still in a, in a group razor or whatever. Yeah. Stay three nights in Mossel Bay. The one day you go to Oetswering, yes. which is an hour's drive. You can be back the afternoon. You can sit on your balcony, enjoy a drink, walk on the beach. Mm. What can you do in, in Oetswering? You sit in the guest house. What do you really <laughs> see? Okay. Then I said, fine. Apologies to all our Oetswering Yeah, sorry, but, but that was our, I thought about it. That was, your, it. That that was your, your message. My marketing ploy yes, at that stage. Yes. Um, Nysner is an hour and a half away. Yeah. Go to Nysner, go to the heads on, on a boat trip, do everything there, but come back again. Mm. And if I could get them back... Almost I could, make this their... Obviously make it their base. Base. Yeah. Because one thing is people don't get their washing done because they only stay one night at a place. And if, if you've been to the ostriches, you've been to Nysner, but you want to experience the garden route the, with the emphasis on experience... Not just see, yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. Stay in a central place. And that started paying off. Um, I'm not going to mention, but two big uh, travel companies, we, got, we swung them to make Marcel Bay. Their base. To make the US their base. That's but fantastic, yeah. yeah. So, but now that market has also changed a little. Um, by the third year I went, I realized that the guys have moved to FITs. Now, FIT is a foreign international traveler. Okay. Or foreign independent traveler. Mm -hmm. um, they started booking a holiday to South Africa. Mm. Well, all they did was their flight. Not as part of a tour group then. No. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. They, they, they individual travelers. Okay. They book uh, their, their, their flight to Cape Town, they book one or two nights in Cape Town, and they book um, car hire, because now they've been here, they've traveled in the bus, they've seen our roads are perfect to mm. travel on. So they actually come back then? But then they come back on their own time. That's absolutely and fantastic. And your FIT is the guy you really want in your establishment, because if he likes where he's staying, and he likes the area, he's remember, he's, all he's booked was his flight here, flight back, Mm. Um, car hire, one or two nights in Cape Town, and the rest is an open book, and you can write his itinerary for him. That's a, yeah, that's great. Now, that, that was a, a shift we saw towards the 2006, 2007. What has happened now in Europe with the, the Euro, um, and specifically with the Greek tragedy, as I call it, yes. was that your Europeans couldn't go on long um, all holidays as much as they wanted to. Or used to. Or used to. Mm. And, and, and your our, uh, traditional markets were your Belgians, your um, Netherlands, German, Greek, Italian. Those were the people that came to our shores. And that has now changed. If you go to a place like Otsua now, you'll be amazed to see how many busloads of um, people there are Chinese, Indians, and that has opened a totally new market. Remember, we must keep up, not with the Joneses here, we must keep up with, with the Rajas and, you know, exactly. whatever Chinese so um, can But now, yeah. when, when you do get people with a different culture, for instance, that was something else that, that the, the um, Eastern market, that Diaz could capitalize on, it had 86 rooms, you have in, in a, your Eastern tradition or um, culture, culture. Yes. There's a lot of animosity towards difference in the sense of why should your room have a shower and mine a bath? Oh, really? They, the differentiation, there's, it's got to do with, what do they call it in the Indian culture? Custer. Oh, the case yes, system. The, the case system. Okay. So you can't have a room that have got something different to me if we're on the same level. Okay. And that's why hotels, bigger hotels, are the ones that can capitalize on them. Because it's so similar room you, by You room. need to otherwise, yeah. in themselves, the group, feel offended. 
That's 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 very enlightening. It's something that I actually it didn't, didn't realize. Know. Yeah, I didn't yeah. realize that. And and I think that's something maybe you know my my next question would have been, what opportunities do you see still in tourism for for our viewers in, obviously in in this area, but also in South Africa. And I think you've. You've I'm already, starting to touch on that. You've already answered some of it, you know. Because Dion, if you if you're a vegetarian, for yes. instance, and you visit an area, you look for a restaurant that um, serves vegetarian dishes. You you're not likely to go to a steakhouse that have only got steaks on the menu. Because what are you going to eat? Chips, mm. French fries. Mm. So you start looking for. A product or a um, uh, restaurant. I'm trying to look for a, a business person that have seen the opportunity and are starting to cash in on vegetarians. Exactly with the people from the east, they eat different food. Our restaurants will need to start catering Thinking for about those people. That, yeah, and, yeah? And, and planning for that. Denise, I just need to stop us for a second here yeah, because uh, just to make sure that we can still continue with the interview on a on a different tape. <laughs> so you we'll, have we gone all the way and filling we've one gone already. All the, day, all the way. So let's stop and we'll we'll take it further in the next one. Okay, and welcome back. Uh, little technological issues there. We had to change the uh, the recording, uh, but we're uh, we're running again. Um, we're talking to Denise Lloyd, and Denise, I think in, uh, in our previous session we've, we've spoken a lot about tourism, um, especially in this area. Um, what, before we started recording, you know, you had a, a very interesting thought. Um, you called it your theory about people, <laughs> which I enjoyed quite a bit. And I thought for, for entrepreneurs, your theory was something that's quite applicable. So maybe you can share your theory about people. <laughs> yeah, um, viewers, I've had people think that I'm a nutcase um, when I start talking about this. And they think I want to make some kind of a fruit salad. But it's not really. I perceive people as either apples or oranges. And it's got nothing to do with the figures. It's, a, it's not a physical thing. It's not a physical thing. It's not yes. that they either round. They are actually round, but it doesn't have to do with the figures. Mm. Now, an apple is round and an orange is round. But just think about this for a moment. If you take an apple mm. and there is a bad patch on this apple um, and you cut it out, the white of the apple starts going brown. There's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's going to rot. Yeah. It's going to rot. Unless yeah. you eat it mm. and eat it quick, mm. it's going to rot. If you take an orange, it's got different segments. Mm. If you have a, a mosquito or not mosquito, a, 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 a fruit fly or, fly or something, yeah. and it should sting <clears throat> through the, the skin or through the peel of an orange, and you open that orange and you see, but there's this one segment that is... Um, not nice anymore, it's gone rotten or whatever, you can take it out. But if you, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the rest of the orange. Because it's, it's in it's cells. Segments, almost, it's segments. segments. Mm. So it's got different facets. The apple itself is one. It's, the whole thing is an apple in there. <laughs> These are segments. Now, you, I see people, I perceive people like that. You've got your apple people, they might be good in one thing. Now, something goes wrong. And the carpet is pulled out from underneath them. If, if, if you take away that one thing from them. If you take away that one thing that they're good at. Yes. Their yes. whole world crumbles. Okay, okay. Now you've got your, your, your orange people. <laughs> and you've taken that segment out. Yes. But, but you can position them together again. It might affect their life. But their whole world it doesn't, doesn't ruin crumb. Them. It doesn't. It doesn't ruin them. There's other aspects they can go ahead with. <laughs> I think with. that's great. So and, and, and that's how I see people. Mm. And, and your Apple people are, are one-faceted people. Mm. Uh, they, they can talk a, a very, uh, they can talk for hours about their, their interest, what they're good in. But try and get them to talk about something else. And the chances are that you won't. Mm. 
orange people, oh, they can talk about lots and lots of things. And that's also where I say to you that people tend to stick to one talent that they have. They, they um, tend to be good at something. Yeah, that one thing. The recession comes, they, their business crumbles on that, yeah. and they're down and out. Yeah. Your, your orange people, their one uh, um, thing they were good in gets taken away, and they bounce back, and they're on to the others. Mm. And there I also say to you that I believe that we are all um, given different talents. We develop one talent, and we get very good in that. And we don't develop the others. And mm. one day, the Lord's going to ask you, what did you do with those other talents? Did I didn't give you only one. You were good at this, but boy, yeah. oh boy, you could have been good yeah. at a lot of things. You had more talents. Uh, yeah, and that's where entrepreneurship comes in. Yes. People often are in a area where they are comfortable. So unless they get a boot to get them out of it, they're not going to uh, venture into other avenues. And I think what's interesting, you know, being an entrepreneur myself... And you, you are a, an, an orange, eh? <laughs> Thanks, I thought so. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a, that's a great analogy. Um, because more often than not, entrepreneurs have to, almost not by choice, but because they are forced, you know, to be good at different things. You know, they have to be the marketers, they have to be the technical people. The computers break down, you know, it's the entrepreneur that has to go out and <laughs> try and fix it. Fix it. Uh, they have to, to do, be the business developers, they have to do the accounting, they have to do a lot of things. And um, as an entrepreneur, it's, it's good to be good at something. But I've often seen, you know, it's not because you can bake the best pies that you will have the best bakery. You know, it's a, it's a different skill set. Being technically good at something, such as, you know, as I said, you know, being a baker, it does not make you a good bakery owner. And, and I think that's where your analogy is absolutely fitting. Um, entrepreneurs have to do a lot of things, and it's just one of those things. You have to do a lot of things, and you have to venture out almost in, into the unknown. Um, no, I think it's a, it's, a fantastic, it's a fantastic analogy. But Dion, you know, when, when I started off in journalism, we had photographers. You were a reporter, and a photographer went with you. It's now evolved into uh, most of us do our own photography. And that was, well, I was trained in it, but I never did it because, as there I say, was a yeah. Photographer. Yeah. then when I came to Mossel Bay, I had to start taking my own pictures. And I mean, that is a, a totally different um, skill to writing. Mm. And I started enjoying it so much. Um, and, and now <laughs> I look at, at people uh, when I do have somebody that can take pictures for me, heaven's alive, they don't capture what you see this, and what you what want I to get see, there. Exactly. Mm. So I've mm. now learned that when I do an article <laughs> and I listen to what the people are saying, what are they telling, I see in pictures. So I see the picture, the photograph that I want to take. Of course. And it would never, if I didn't have to take the pictures myself. I would never be able to have developed that skill. Another great analogy. I think, you know, venturing out makes you understand more things and it makes you a better, a better entrepreneur, probably. Yeah, you can see the bigger picture. Yeah, of Because course. you can see the end product. You know where you're going, what it is that you're visualizing. I can see what the page needs to look like. Mm. So if, if it was about people, but somehow there was a car involved, um, if I didn't write the story. I wouldn't know that the car was supposed to be involved. I wouldn't take a picture of the person and the car. No, of course. What, what, what I hear you say is, and, and, and we started out this interview actually quite long ago, <laughs> 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 with, with um, you know, briefly touching on, on, on the importance of, of copywriting and, and telling stories um, in business. And you know, I, I want to bring it back to that also. Um, I almost want to put you on the spot and ask you, you know, with your background, having been in marketing and, and, and being a journalist, um, with all your experiences, what do you think is the importance of, of, of telling stories or copywriting then for, for entrepreneurs? 
Dion, I think a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners, you know, your, your more formal type of mm. business owner, they miss the bus totally. Yes. They don't see in context that if you have the right story, mm. that can benefit your business so much that people can see the bigger picture about your business. Mm. You might be a brilliant you're no longer a lawyer, but you might be a brilliant I'm lawyer. I'm still a lawyer. <laughs> oh, but you don't practice law anymore. I just anymore, don't practice yeah. law. But yeah. you, the fact that you know what the pitfalls are mm. when you sign a contract mm. for a business yes. makes it so much easier for you not mm. to fall into those pitfalls. Now, you can tell entrepreneurs, this is what you need to watch out for, but you can't, you can't meet up with all the entrepreneurs. Mm. Now, you write a document to say... When you do enter into a contract, yeah. this is yeah. the pitfall right. you are looking for. Yeah. In effect, if you have somebody that writes that um, in, in, a, in a way that the man in the street can understand it, that's mm. copywriting. Mm. So you're getting the message out there to the person about the pitfalls. Mm. If you didn't write it, if you, if you don't write it down and you don't share it with the entrepreneurs, mm. they're not going to know about it. That's copywriting. Somebody once said to me, I agree with you completely. Somebody once said to me that copywriting is merely writing something in such a way that the person that you've intended to read that writing or that message takes the action that you intended them to take. So copywriting is getting people to take the action that you want them to take. And isn't that exactly what you know, being a business owner is all about? You know, you, you, you can get a lot of people in through your marketing and all of that, but then you need to get them to take action. Yeah. And that you do, you know, one of the ways, obviously, is by, is by copywriting. By copywriting. And I, as I said, I think a lot of business people don't realize the importance of copywriting. Mm. And then of corporate image. Yeah, true. When, true. When your receptionist answers this phone, mm. and... I can't identify your company with the person answering the phone or the way the person answers the phone. I mean, you're losing me. I might have been a potential client, but you're losing me. And the person there doesn't realize it unless the, uh, they've been trained, unless they've been told, unless they've been given a piece of paper that stipulates this is your duties, this but is this is the way you need to do it. Mm -hmm. So it all boils down to... You as a business owner, sitting down, mm. thinking, where am I going? What, what, what am I trying to achieve with my company? Mm. What am I trying to achieve with, with this entrepreneurial um, business I'm moving forward to? Um, and then think about the corporate image. I want people to know that I am the best journalist in the whole Southern Cape. Yes. I must actually show you my... My own business card. I've seen no. your business card. I was, I was <laughs> going to ask about that. Yeah. <laughs> Where I say, hello, I'm your um, uh, official or I'm the, the, the fortune cookie writer. I'm your yeah, fortune yeah, cookie, cookie writer. writer. That's, that, that, with, with the beautiful picture of a fortune cookie yeah. in front. Yeah. And at the, the back, it, it cites what all the things I can do. And it says, let you, me you write your it, story. You actually say at the top of the back side of the, the business card, you actually say, I can also help you with... Uh, this and this and this and then this you list the other things. Yeah, and then I say, um, mm. let me write your story. <laughs> and it all boils down to yeah. that, uh, as I was saying, that if you realize where you're going and you can format your corporate image around that and you take your people with you, everybody in your company knows that you want to be the best estate agency there is in town. How are you going to achieve it? Mm -hmm. what, what, what I hear you saying is that you start with the end in mind. You start yeah. with the end in mind. Yes. And then you must remember the people. People are your um, real, uh, the word I'm looking for, uh, people are your best asset and they're also your, uh, your, not richness, help me, the word I'm looking for. Is Almost like your, 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 your wealth, wealth and your currency. They, they are your currency. Mm. But if they don't know, mm. and if you don't treat them the way mm. to let them feel mm. that they are your currency, you're not going to know. It. And if once again, if you've got a, a bottom-up-to-top kind of approach, 
you will realize what makes them tick to yeah. get to you. But if it's a down, or a, a top to down, mm. you're ne never going to know if they realize what the product is, what the product, the, the essence of the product is. Mm. And what your, what your message, message is that you want to convey to your your clients or your potential clients. Yeah, I, I like always, that. I always say that um, it's that old um, saying of if you've got anything you want to advertise, you need to tell people what it is that you want to get out there. It's no, no use you uh, winking in the dark at a beautiful girl. You know you're trying to, to draw her attention. She doesn't even know you exist because she can't see you. It's exactly the same. It's how the same. can you tell get people the out there? Out. How can you get the message out yeah. if you're not saying to people what it is that you want? And very often, or, or, or what it is that you have, sorry. Very, very often, you need to write it down. So you see it on paper. Mm. All your people see it on paper. And you can all start working towards that specific mm. goal that you want. I think that's fantastic. I, I, I have... One more thing that I wanted to ask you about. Um, you told me that you were quite involved at some stage in your career uh, with the Center of Conflict Resolution. Um, what was that all about? That was also about a decade ago when the Center of Conflict Resolution at the University of Cape Town, they decided to embark on a specific project. They called it Psalm Spun, which is directly translated Pulled together. Pulled together. <laughs> yeah. And it so happened that that was your school's name too, Yes, eh? yes, <laughs> yes. My, my primary school Your was primary like, school. Pulled together. Pulled together. <laughs> what they did was they yeah. identified three areas in the, in the um, Cape. The first was Uniondale as a remote little town. Mossel Bay as a fishing town in those, year, those days. And That's before you started with the marketing of the hotel, of course. Yes, yes. yes that was quite yeah, before that. And Grabo, yes. which is a melting pot, uh, politically speaking. It's you, been, even today, it, still. It's even today, today yeah. still now. And they chose 20 um, people from each yes. community. And it was a three-year course that we did um, once a week for uh, like three hours. And in the end, it wasn't even 20 individuals from these three towns that um, qualified. And they went from from the idea that if you have somebody in a community that can act as a community conflict resolutor, it makes more sense. That person knows the community. Um, it's not as if you're bringing somebody from the outside who've got no empathy, mm. knowledge, and that knows all the different um, mm, mm. aspects of conflict resolution. So, yeah, they, they, they get the conflict almost resolved by somebody who knows them and the area yeah. and, and, and somebody that's known to those people that are in conflict also. Yeah, and what that taught Fantastic. me yeah. was to move back two steps mm. out of a situation, look at it, and we once did a, uh, an example which I thought was perfect. They said, say for instance, this is a line, um, and the conflict is there where the camera is, mm. and this is as far as you can get away from it. Where would you position yourself on this line? If that was the conflict, where would you position yourself? Sure, back in the day, I would have been right there. <laughs> but yeah. that's my personality. It's probably better to be here. Uh, well, not knowing what, there is not a right or a wrong yes. answer, but yeah, the same, I went right next to the camera. Yeah, you were on top of the camera, was... beating it down with a stick. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> And we started yes. looking at why do most people, but most, most of the others were here, far away, because they, they tried to move away mm. from conflict. Mm. Lots mm. of people mm. don't like conflict mm. situations. Mm. They would rather stay in the background, let other people handle the conflict. And um, when we started analyzing why some people are not afraid of being there on the camera and the others here, it, it comes from your upbringing. It's, it your, it's from, the whole nature versus nurture thing. Yeah. yeah. Is it your nature or is it, is it exactly, how you grew up? Exactly, it is. And, and that why, why do some people not shy away? Is it because they were, as a child, given the opportunity to express to themselves? To express themselves? Mm. Or were they always told, kids need to be seen and not to be heard? Mm. Because those not to be, and to be seen and not to be heard kids are the ones here. 
because they never had the opportunity to express themselves. Interesting. And, and um, the first question they asked me, because I was the only one on the camera, why? Why aren't you scared of conflict? And I said, you know, I don't know. But they asked what, what kind of father I had, what kind of uh, um, house I came from. And I said, yeah, it's very funny. My father, father came from Wales. So he was a Saudi. My mother was an Afrikaner. My father got disinherited because he married an Afrikaner. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I remember it was the Boer and the Brit yes, and the English yeah, and that. Not on the same side no, at that time. But my father um, said, kids need to express themselves. Mm. They need to know that they can say what they feel. Mm. And I can remember as a child, my dad would, me and my sister put us around the table with my mom and said, okay, it's time that we can go on holiday. Are we going to Artenbos or are we going to Cape Town? My grandmother lived in Cape Town at that stage. I couldn't understand her. She came from Wales too. Um, with the Welsh kind of dialect, I mean, I felt totally out of the bus. Um, just incidentally, yes. viewers, my surname is Lloyd, but in, in, in Welsh it's pronounced as Hoyd. There isn't a double L. It's Llewellyn. It's not Llewellyn. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so it's got that Celtic sound to it. Yes. Um, I couldn't understand it. So we would say, Hartenbos, we're going to Hartenbos. And then my dad would say, okay. But you know what? Your grandmother is, is ill. So we actually need to go to Cape Town mm. to see her. And in the end, we went to Cape Town. So it wasn't the case of that he would listen to us, but he gave us the opportunity to express ourselves. At least express your opinion. I, uh, yeah. And I grew up with that, that I, it's okay. I can differ from you. I don't have to agree with you. If I have enough respect for what you're saying, I can try and um, convince you that I'm right. Mm. But I need to do it with the respect to okay. say it's fine. Yeah. If you, you feel the way you do. I feel this way, we can talk about it. Mm. It, it doesn't need to go into an argument. Mm. And that's the difference. And, and you mentioned when we spoke about this before we started the recording, you mentioned to me that, um, uh, you know, getting into the conflict, and, and again, I want to relate it to entrepreneurs, is that, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are often very passionate about their product, their business, maybe their staff or, or, or whatever, you know. it's. It, how can you not be? You know, you pour your heart and soul into, into that venture. It's, it's what you want to do. Yeah. Of course, you're going to be passionate about it. And when there's passion involved, it's very difficult to take yourself out of the situation and, and, and you know, just take criticism, maybe. But you said a very true thing, and that is, you know, remove yourself sometimes, you know, from, from the conflict itself, if, if it arises. Uh, because once you get into it, you know, you've lost. If you get into a screaming match, with now, a client or a competitor, anybody, anybody start. I mean, even if you win the screaming match, you've still lost. I agree. You've lost your I agree. self-respect. You've lost the ability to control yourself. Yes. And then you've lost. Just keep... If, 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 if the, you focus on this, this is what the conflict is about. So you're focusing on this. It's, yeah, what do you see? You see this. If those two steps back, suddenly you see, oh, there's an area around it. I don't have to go through that conflict. I can go around it. Mm. I can start looking from the other side. Mm. And that's all that it really boils down to is give those two steps back, take a deep breath, give yourself half a minute. If you think you count till 10 and... This is something I only learned the other day. We always say count to 10. It takes your brain about apparently 10 seconds to, to kick back to another thought. Okay. So if that's why we count to 10. Okay. It's and to, to it, give your brain a chance to, to see the way around. Exactly. And not focus on this injustice that's uh, in there. Yeah, uh, yeah. so, so give that one step back. Take a deep breath. Yes. Count to 10. And look at that glass and say, ah, ah, and you were just about to jump into that yes, glass, eh? Yeah. I, as a, as a, as a lawyer, <clears throat> um, 
I'm also one of those people who would probably be right on top of the camera, as I said, beating it with a, with a stick. <laughs> um, I also come from a family where you know, we've spoken our mind. And uh, it, it, it's very true. Once you, I know from, from personal experience that once you've gone over that line, whatever that line might mean for, for you, uh, but we all know where, where it is. Once you've allowed yourself, because it doesn't matter what happens externally, what somebody says to you about your business, about whatever, you still allow yourself to go over that line. And I'm the first one to admit that once you are over the line, it's very difficult, sometimes even just plain impossible, to, to get yourself back you know, from the screaming match and from wanting to, to beat this person with a stick sometimes. Um, so the point is, don't go there. Don't go there. Because when you realize you've stepped over that line, you start getting angry with yourself. Yes. And then you look for the, the uh, problem in everybody else. Mm. Then, it's, then it's very difficult to try and realize you might be the mm. problem. Mm. Denise, we're almost at the end of our, of our interview. I just want to, at this stage, take the opportunity to, to remind all our viewers um, that these type of interviews, uh, the video trainer interviews, will be on a very regular basis. Uh, we'd love you to be part of it. Uh, send us your questions. Um, go to the website, vidtrainer.co.za. There's a, there's a little uh, box on the side where you can enter your name and your email address, and we'll keep you updated of these interviews as they become available on a regular basis. And, and it will be, you know, this type of interview where we often talk to people who have proven themselves in business uh, or people with a specific skill or background um, and, and, and something that will really help our viewers to, to improve their businesses or their, their own personal development. So I thank you for, for that and being part and being one of our first interviewees. Um, it was an absolute pleasure having you here. Uh, where can our viewers see more of you or read more of you uh, or maybe keep tabs on what you are doing? Well, at this stage, um, I'm involved with a um, Media24 newspaper, a so-called Knock and Drop, and it comes out every Wednesday. There's an um, edition for Muscle Bay and there's one for mm. George, and there are some of the pages that we share. So if you want to read what's happening in our area yes. and... Uh, um, Get the look and feel of what I was trying to say to you guys about good news stories, yes. about putting um, yourself, a little bit of yourself into these articles. You can go to www.edenexpress.co.za and as I said, the paper appears every Wednesday and then the um, website is updated. Uh, normally or often on a Wednesday, you can already read all the news stories, otherwise the Thursday and mm. definitely by the Wednesday. Mm. And there are also a gallery with pictures that we don't print or we print one and then there's the six rest. others that you yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that is, that's where you can actually see more and learn more about me. And I feel like a real idiot when uh, Dion spoke about Link. Because I, he, uh, he said he, he goes there once or twice a week. <gasps> uh, the fact that I'm still there, a freelance journalist, but I was one for quite some time, um, makes me feel that I'm not really on top of the technology, but I'll go and I'll fix that <laughs> one, definitely. And just to tell you, my kids are now grown, and uh, I always knew I would go back to journalism yes. full time. And that's where I'm now. So you are following the passion. I'm following the passion. And you, yeah. uh, you can sell anything, you can do anything, as long as you believe in yourself and you've got the passion for it. Fantastic. It was an absolute pleasure having you here. Um, as we go through our interviews, I think we might just have to get you back for, a, for another one. Oh, I'd love to do that. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> it was much. fun. Thanks. That's it, and we'll see you in the, in the next uh, video trainer interview. Thanks a lot.